<laughs> well, welcome to the Cinnabar. Today we've got a fantastic episode for you. See, see, today we're shooting a Winchester 1886 in 5110. And what great fun. But this old girl has been a heck of a challenge. So let's head on down to the shop and we'll show you what it took to get this thing repaired and running and shooting again. Now this one's kind of a cool shooter grade, 86, and and the fellow that sent it's a good customer who sent some some guns up in the past from from down in Texas, and he'd always wanted a 5110. So one of them came at came up at uh, one of the big auction houses, and and people weren't bidding much on it, so he took a chance and bid on it. But when he got it home, he found it had some problems, and the, and the biggest issue it had, and why he sent it up here, was that. It had this kind of a funky two-thirds length magazine tube on it and it had been installed poorly. It's not, it wasn't factory original. So, so they just cut a groove in the bottom of the barrel and, and put a cap with a little lip on it that rode in that groove. But the problem is there was nothing holding it in place. So that cap could just rotate around and fall out of the groove. And then, of course, your magazine tube can just fall out or on recoil. <laughs> Basically, you just shoot out of there. Um, so he sent it up to me. He got the the letter from from Jesse and the crew over at uh, the Cody Firearms Museum and come back as a as a button mag, half magazine. So we we converted it back to to a button mag, and that that conversion went really really well. Didn't take a whole bunch, although I did have to turn a new uh, plug on the on the lathe, and, but it aged really nicely and, and fits the rest of the uh, patina. So it was time to, to kind of check the rest of the gun out before I sent it back. And I found some more issues with it. And, and the first of which is that it has a little bit of headspace. So we're, I'm going to show you how, how I check the headspace and come to that conclusion and what we're going to try to do to, to repair that. Now the next thing I did is I've got some, some dummy rounds of 5110 here and uh, tried to cycle. Well, it doesn't cycle either. It's got, a, got an issue with the carrier where it's not coming up enough so the, the front of the uh, cartridge or the bullet is just stubbing on the back of the barrel so we're going to have to fix that when it, looking down and we can see that the carrier is actually broken and probably bent as well so we're going to get it all apart and see if maybe we can either repair that carrier or maybe we're going to just going to have to replace it with another carrier now i'm going to let you in on a little secret and that's that most of these old rifles if they've been shot quite a bit have developed at least a little bit of excess headspace and especially in the toggle link early Winchesters. But we don't get too excited if there's a little bit of excess headspace in a 3220, 3840, 4440, unless we're, we're really going for accuracy, because it, it, headspace will affect your accuracy some. It's a little harder on your brass, that kind of thing. But when we're shooting something as powerful as 5110, it becomes quite a little bit more critical. So we're going we're gonna to check the headspace on this one. Uh, pretty simple process. All we really have to do is, is remove the extractor, and, and that's pretty simple stuff. We just pull the bolt back. It exposes the pin that holds that extractor. We just take a punch and, and punch out that pin. I've already got this extractor out, but most of the time they come out really easily, unless they've been in there a long time or somebody's kind of peened over the end of those, those pins. Now, the next thing we need is a, a uh, gauge, a headspace gauge. Now I know it kind of can get kind of confusing. We've got go gauges, we've got no go gauges, we've got field gauges. But in this situation, what we use is a field gauge. A go gauge and a no go gauge is for setting up a new barrel or chambering a new barrel to, to get it just right and dialed in. But we have a little bit of, of room on, on, a, on a gun that's been shot. And so Sammy's has um, recommendations for the maximum amount of headspace allowable in a, in a gun that's been fired and that's what the field gauge measures. So basically we've got the extractor out and we've got this field gauge which has the thickness, the maximum amount of thickness that, that we can be allowed in this according to Sammy specs and that's just a little bit thicker than the, the rim on a 5110 here. And of course, these rimmed cartridges, they headspace on the rim. It's the distance between the back of the barrel and the front of the bolt face that, that, that we're using for headspace. So if this closes on it, then we've got more than headspace than we should have, and it does close on it. So the problem with headspace gauges is they only tell us 
that we've got too much headspace, but it doesn't tell us how much. And if we've got a thousandth head, extra headspace or twenty thousandths, it just closes and tells us it's too much. So what I do, and maybe you've seen this before if you watch this channel, I've showed it before, is I take just some scotch tape, cellophane tape, put on the back, and it's roughly two thousandths. So we can, we can get within a couple thousandths here, and I just take a, a razor blade or an a X-Acto knife here and trim that off, the excess tape. I gotta get my glasses on. Usually it just trims right off easy, but when I get the camera on, nothing goes smoothly. <laughs> okay, so now we've got our maximum allowable headspace plus two thousandths. Let's see if it closes. Now the nice thing is, is that a lot of these headspace gauges will work on multiple calibers. So this one's actually a 4570 headspace gauge and it just barely closed. So I think we're just a little over two thousandths here. So if a 5110 and a, a 4570 have the same rim thickness so that we can use the same headspace gauge. So let's try another one. I suspect, because that one just barely closed, that this one isn't going to close. So if I'm, if I'm right, we're going to be somewhere between two and four thousandths headspace. And I think closer to the two. But that's why we go through this process. Okay, so we've got four thousandths beyond SAMI specs for recommended headspace in a 5110. Let's see if it closes. Nope, it doesn't. See, the hammers, or the levers down here, so we're not, not closing all the way. And it's quite a ways from there, so it's, it's amazing kind of how much a couple thousandths can make on the stroke of our lever here. But that's, that's where we're at. So we're probably at somewhere between two and three thousandths in all reality here. Now we've got a couple of options to take up the headspace. And they're, they're, it's a pretty simple concept, but they can be a little bit difficult. So basically to take up the headspace, the headspace is the, the, from the distance from the, the back of the cartridge to the front of the bolt face. So we have to either move the barrel back to move the, that cartridge back, or we have to move the bolt face forward. Now to move the barrel back is quite a process. We have to pull the barrel out, put it in the lathe, turn one more revolution or one more thread onto it, and then deepen the chamber a little bit, and cut the back of the barrel back a little bit, because most Winchesters are, are 20 threads to the inch, which is 50 thousandths. So we, if, we, if we set that back, then that chamber has to move forward a little bit. The other thing that it does is then it moves the dovetails back 50 thousandths as well, so we have to take that into consideration. We have to make some adjustments uh, in how, how your forend is mounted and your magazine tube is mounted. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a involved process and a pain in the backside, to be honest. The other way that we, we can take up that headspace, though, is by moving that bolt forward. And in the case of an 86, of course, we know that 86 is locked up with these locking blocks here and here, and if they've got a little bit of wear on them, then we can just replace those with a little fresher locking blocks that maybe have a, a little more width to them and, and take up, in this case, very little, just two, three thousandths. You know, if it moves up, up even four thousandths, we're still gonna be with, within tolerance. So what I, I've got a, another set of, of pretty fresh looking locking blocks here, so we're gonna pull this thing out and, and take this thing apart and replace those locking blocks and then retest it. Okay, so we've got this 86 receiver apart and we've got these locking blocks out. Let's take a minute and measure them up and just see how wide they are. So this one's 744, this one 744, and we've got this other set that, that looks like they're maybe in a little fresher, a little better shape. And we're at 749, 748 and a half. So we've got around five thousandths extra width in these locking blocks. So we were thinking we were probably two and a half, three thousandths 
uh, excess headspace, we should be able to take that up and get right back into spec by just replacing these locking blocks with a little nicer, fresher set. And that's going to beat the heck out of going through a barrel setback, for sure. Now, it, it's conceivable we could weld up the edge of these these locking blocks and mill them back, but the problem is I don't weld on any of these parts that are going to be taken recoil, especially from something as powerful as a 5110. You know, you're just altering the, the state of the, of the metal, um, so we don't, we don't weld locking blocks, we don't weld bolts, we don't weld around the front of the receiver here or the barrel. Um, and and the, uh, the other issue is, is that, see that file skates, this, this is hardened. So much simpler just to, to find a fresher set of locking blocks if, if you can do that. Okay, the next issue that we ran into, of course, was that this, this cartridge was stubborn on the bottom of the barrel when we were trying to cycle the action. And we could see from the top that we had a break in the carrier right here. And so this, all the uh, pressure is down here on the bottom part of this carrier. This whole arm is held down by here. So when this broke, it actually bent the front of this carrier. And you may be able to see it here, but it's not a, a lot, but it's just enough that um, it, it's causing that not to, to cycle correctly. Now, most likely what happened is we had a cartridge that didn't fully seat into the carrier like this and then the front edge was, was still in the magazine tube. And when that happened, somebody got frustrated and just started cranking on that lever and broke the carrier, bent the front of the carrier. When, when, you're, when your gun doesn't cycle properly, <laughs> don't get frustrated and start cranking on the lever. You know, what, what was probably a minor problem to start with is now become a much more difficult problem. Now this one can be repaired. We can weld on this one. We'll bend it back, weld it up and whatnot. Now I had considered just throwing this other carrier in that I had from another 1886, but there's a problem with that notion. You see, when Winchester designed this 5110 for the 1886, they had to make several modifications to the, the rifles to make them work. You see, these, these rifles were designed for this 4570 and of course the, the 4082, 4065, some of the others are very similar in size and they all work through the same mechanism. But you can see we've got not only a longer cartridge with the, the 5110, but the, the body of it is quite a bit larger diameter. So there were several modifications that had to be made and one of them was the carrier. You see, while this, this carrier readily accepts a 4570, a 5110 just does not fit. And it can be modified, but when I got to thinking about it, I just decided this one's already opened up to fit the 5110. We might as well fix it up. So we, we bent this one back, welded it back up, and then we had to bend it and straighten again because the heat of the weld uh, twisted some things up, but we think we got it pretty good now. So in order to make these 5110s work in the 86, now there had to be some modifications in to, to get them to feed through the loading gate. The, the inside of the, the magazine tube is thinned out on one side. Some of them actually, the, the receiver itself had to be opened up a little bit for clearance. Um, with the link here, there's a, there's a little, let's see if we can get this focused here. There's a little relief cut here. It had to be opened up some more. Um, the barrel itself, there's some chamfering that had to go on in there and then of course the uh, carrier as well. So there's a lot of modifications. If you, if you want to um, change say a, a 4570 86 to 5110, all these modifications have to be done. Of course the ones that came out originally in 5110, Winchester had done those modifications. So we're going to throw this, this carrier that we, we've got a whole lot of work into now to get it fixed up and re-welded and whatnot. We'll throw it in, test it out, uh, make sure it cycles, make sure our headspace is right, and then it's time to go shooting. Now this rifle came into us needing a fairly simple repair. We were just going to shorten up this two-thirds magazine back to the button mag as it uh, originally lettered. But the more we got into it, the more we found. And of course, we found that it had some excess headspace, and I think we've got that fixed and, and fairly easily. Um, and when I pulled the stock off, I could see there was a big split right down the wrist of the stock, so we ended up doing a stock repair on it too. But what's really been frustrating is getting this thing to feed. I think there was some mix and match parts in there, 
and I ended up doing a, a lot of grinding and polishing and trying again and finally just ended up painting a dummy cartridge with a sharpie just painting it black and then seeing where it rubbed off the the black marks and then we did some more grinding more polishing a little bit of welding grinding polishing and now I think we've got it feeding okay so first thing we need to do of course is check this headspace now again you know it would close on this field gauge before the the, the rim on this is 77 thousandths now the rim on a 5110 and I think all the 86 cartridges is 70 thousandths so we've got a, a an area in there between 70 thousandths and 77 where this should should fall and we shouldn't be able to close on here and we don't so we can see we've got a little gap in there and I'd estimate as far as that down as that lever is that we're probably about 74 75 thousandths right in there where it should be and that, that that'd be good even for a, a new barrel that we were just chambering Okay, the other side of that is we want to make sure that we haven't taken up too much headspace, that there's still room to get a cartridge in there. So we've got an uh, empty here shell, and the first thing we're going to do is put this extractor back. Remember I said it was an easy process to get them out, just as easy to go back. We're just going to line the, the hole in the extractor and the line and the hole in the uh, bolt here up, and then drive this pin in. Okay, just that easy. All right, so let's see what this empty brass does. It's 70 thousandths. Great. There it goes. <laughs> and the extractor works too. All right, so now the moment of truth. We spent all this time getting this thing to, to uh, cycle. Let's see if we can get it to cycle now. Hey, I think we're ready to go light a fire in this old girl. All right, so here we go. We finally get to the point where we can test fire this old girl and see how she's going to do. Now, thankfully, the, the owner sent me quite a few rounds of loaded black powder 5110. Thanks, Curtis. It's always nice to, to shoot somebody else's ammo up, especially these are, are spendy little rounds to buy and, or even to reload for that matter. We're just going to single one, single load one, put it on paper, and then, uh, you know, if we have to make any adjustments, we will, but then we're just going to test it out and see how she cycles, see how she shoots, and maybe even kill a jug or two. So this first shot, we'll just shoot right off the bench here. Well, that's not good. Well, remember when I said this is one of those guns that the more you look, the more you find wrong with it? Well, the one thing I didn't look at was firing pin protrusion. So let's check and see what this primer looks like. And sure enough, there's just a little dimple on it. So I guess we're back down to the shop for a little more work on this old girl before we can do a little shooting with it. Okay, so I've got this 86 apart for what I sincerely hope is the last time now. And we can see with the bolt out, we've got plenty of firing pin protrusion here. Now our goal is, is about 50,000. So, you know, if we're much less than that, we start seeing misfires like what we saw up on the hill. If we're a lot more than that, then we can start piercing primers. But this in the firing position was being held back. And in, in an 86, we have a kind of a safety to keep us from, from firing out a battery, and that's built right in to the top of the lever here. So the, they fit together like this, and when the, when the lever's down, you can see that there's, there's this angle right in here, this surface. See if I can get that the right angle so you can see it. And then there's a corresponding angle on the, on the firing pin right here, and they fit together this way. So when that lever is down that firing pins blocked and we can't fire out a battery and when the lever then is, is brought up then that those angles match and the firing pin can go forward the problem is is this was probably mismatched parts and hadn't been fitted properly so those angles weren't weren't uh, the same and and it was holding that firing pin back even with the lever up so it was only protruding about 15 thousandths and that's about what we saw the dimple that we saw on the primer so what i've done 
is I, you have to have to change the angle on one or the other, and I chose to do it on the firing pin because the firing pin's a hardened part all the way through, and the, and the lever is just case hardened. So if we if we change that angle, cut through some of that material, we'd have to recase harden the the lever, or we'd be into soft metal here. So just basically took the took a a diamond file and and worked that that. Uh, angle down on both sides of the firing pin until we can get more protrusion. And, and I think we've got it just about right now. So we'll put this old girl back together and, and maybe we can get it up on the hill and actually do some shooting with it now. All right, let's try this again now. We'll go ahead and load one, make sure it cycles right. Then we'll put one on paper. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so let's see if we can put the herd on a jug or two and maybe even a piece of steel. We can only fit with this button mag three rounds of these 5110s. So we've got to make every shot count. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I can't even see whether I hit or not until the smoke clears. <laughs> Here we go. So that's our three. <laughs> Run out of ammo fast with, with this button magazine. We'll get a couple more targets out there. We've got to test her out good before we send her back to her owner. Okay, let's get some of that steel swinging this time. <laughs> I love shooting that old girl, what a dandy. Now, if you're interested in 1886s and 5110, make sure and check out Lever Guns 50 channel. My good friend Jeremy has done some fabulous work with this rifle and caliber combination. And don't forget, 15% off on all orders at Old Arms of Idaho through the end of the year with discount code CINNABAR2023. Until next time, happy trails from the Cinnabar.